Hi, everyone. We're going to be starting Rob Badger and Nita Winter's um, presentation, A 24-Year Wildflower Journey, The Making of Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers, and Climate Change. So thank you for joining us tonight. And Rob and Nita, take it away. Thank you. Let me share our screen and get to our presentation. Okay. Well, thank you for that nice introduction. And it's nice to be doing another presentation for California Native Plant Society chapters, which we haven't done for a while. We've been doing Audubon and gardens and things like and that. Sierra so, Club chapters. And, and Sierra Club. So it's really nice to be back home with CNPS. Uh, we want to take you on our 27-year journey photographing wildflowers across the, the West on our public lands and specifically in California. And we will start now. And, oh, I just want to, uh, we received the Sierra Club Award, but the book also received 11 other awards, which we were uh, really um, thrilled about. And this book was co-published with, with CNPS. And it was a very collaborative project, not only with CNPS um, statewide who supported us, but also all the chapters and chapter members who helped us find places to go and, and uh, locations for particular flowers we might be looking for. And we also worked with a lot of other organizations as well because we wanted to get a diverse group of voices um, for the wildflowers and our public lands. For those of you who may not be able to stay through the whole um, presentation, we invite you to go to wildflowerbooks.com, which has um, previous recordings of talks as well as information um, about what you can do to make a difference, which was the purpose of the uh, project, and uh, where you can also purchase the books and help support the work that we're doing. So this all started in 1992 uh, when I was doing film. I was processing some film at a photo lab in San Francisco, came across a friend of mine, uh, Liz, Liz Hymans, who was a nature photographer. And she said, did you know that uh, the Antelope Valley, California Poppy Reserve in the Western Mojave is having a really exceptional year? after six pretty bad years, she said, you know, you're a nature photographer in California in the West. I'm sure you've been to the poppy reserve oh, oh, over the years to see the bloom. And I said, no, well, actually I haven't. She said, really, you're a California nature photographer. You've never seen this. Well, we really should go. So a couple of days later, she and another friend of ours and I drove down to the poppy reserve and you all probably know where that is, it's north of Los Angeles in the Western Mojave. When we got there, it was a really, really windy day as often happens in that part of the Western Mojave. So we couldn't photograph because the wind was blowing so much. Went to Joshua Tree, did some rock climbing and photography and came back. It was still windy, but not as much. And I was able to get a few, uh, a few images uh, when I was doing film back then. So. I was standing there, not having seen this before, and watched these waves of wind move across this field of flowers. And what made this a really exceptional year was the fact that uh, there were all these beautiful purple tip bird's eye gilia that were mixed in with the California poppies. I've been there since a few times, and generally you have a wonderful display of these wonderful California poppies, but not with these birds Igelia in there. So uh, like I said, I was able to get a few images off and just stood there after I got my, my images in the camera and just watched this just transfixed to see these waves of wind moving across these golden poppies in these flowers and uh, it's something I'd never seen before. So I called Nita that evening and I said, Nita, uh, you know, you just have to see this. I described what all of us had seen down there. And I said, I just have to, I have to come back and get you. You have to see this before the, the poppies die because the wind could dry things out. So I went back home to San Francisco and got Nita 
And we spent the next few days photographing in the poppy reserve and outside the poppy reserve on other public land. And Rob and I had grown up on the East Coast, so neither one of us had ever experienced this type of, of wildflower displays. And we were hooked at that point. We needed to, to go follow the wildflowers. And at the time I was a people photographer, I had done a big project on the Children of the Tenderloin documentary project, which launched my career na nationwide working with creating healthy communities. And when I met Rob in a photo lab, uh, he was a nature photographer. I was at this lab waiting for some prints and this print showed up. Thank and you. so um, 35 years later, we are still working together and five and a half count, uh, couples counselors later, we found ways to work together. And um, we decided to join efforts and and focus on the wildflowers after a while. So uh, one of the many questions we get asked is, well, uh, what's the oldest image in in the book? And so this is the first image I took that had wildflowers prominently dis displayed in the landscape. I was looking for a beautiful image of a California buckeye tree and I came across these pretty blue flowers. I didn't know what they were at the time. And I said, well, it's be a nice addition to this whole scene of this, you know, beautiful, strange California buckeye. So this was taken in 1984, a couple of years before I met Nita in 1986. And as Nita said, when she met me, I was doing a, I had been doing a lot of landscape photography. And after having done that for probably about 25 years, I was just wanting to do something else with my work than just have images and calendars and magazines or, or shows or, uh, or books. So uh, I started contacting public land agencies and nonprofits uh, contacted the Trust for Public Land, uh, showed them my portfolio and they hired me to do over the years, 33 different projects throughout the state and throughout the West. This image is, of privately held ranch land that was adjacent to Sequoia National Park. The park wanted to add this uh, land to the existing park because of its ecological value. So um, this was uh, just a wonderful springtime with California redbuds and 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 all the other trees. So um, over over the years, I was able to use nature photography in a positive way to help promote uh, land land conservation. I'd also been doing a lot of work on public land with regard to mining, as was mentioned in the introduction. I photographed uh, open pit gold mines in, in different Western regions. I also worked on other environmental issues uh, water issues and logging. It was just getting too too depressing to be in all these places so much of the time and see all this devastation. So I just decided, you know, there's got to be some way to use beautiful nature photography like Ansel Adams had done and everyone else in the past to promote uh, land conservation and uh, and policy change. And I was a people photographer. Um... But before that, I was a firefighter for CDF, California Department of Forestry, which is uh, was later is now known as Cal Fire. And I was stationed up at Leggett in northern Mendocino County, and I was the first female firefighter there in the 13 years the uh, station had been open. And I always kept a, uh, a point and shoot camera on my belt. And I came up from the river after setting some pumps and saw this scene. And these were, um, it was a pile of heavy equipment tires that were burning. And that's why the smoke was so black and entered this into my first photography competition, which was the Nikon International Competition and actually won an award. So I was, I was quite thrilled about that. And as I um, mentioned, I worked on the Children of the Tenderloin Project, which is the image on the right. And that led to working with the Children's Defense Fund out of Washington, DC. And I did a series of calendars where I 
uh, collaborated with an artist, Taya Schrack, who did the hand coloring. And on the right is a series that I did um, in communities in the Bay Area. They were called the Faces Project. And these were seven foot banners that hung in different communities celebrating the diversity, whether it was age diversity, ethnic diversity, um, sexual preference, et cetera. And I was starting to have some health problems um, and was it resulted in issues with my memory. And so I started going doing less of the people photography and going out into the field more with Rob to be able to chase the wildflowers. And with Nita coming out into the field, it mean it meant I would have a wonderful as assistant with a really good eye. And also, not only would she be an assistant, but uh, another photographer to uh, to photograph the flowers. So this is a picture someone took of us uh, at Winnemucca Lake, uh, which is south of South Shore Tahoe. We were told by uh, CNPS members that this was an area where a few different eco regions converged, which meant that there would be uh, quite a bit of biodiversity from each of the different eco regions. So uh, we normally would do our photography as day trips from the car, but this time we decided to carry a whole lot of gear, a lot of camera gear, camping gear, and lighting equipment so we could camp out there and, and be there for so much more time to get the flowers. So I was carrying 85 pounds of gear, Nita was carrying 65 pounds of gear, and uh, it just let us get so many more flowers in the limited amount of time that we were there. So this area, some of you may be familiar with is Carson Pass, which is a great wildflower area. And I normally would carry 25 pounds of equipment. So 65 pounds was definitely too much for me. Um, I decided I wasn't gonna do that again, but it was wonderful to stay in there. Uh, we were there late. This was um, after Labor Day. And it was one of the experiences we had around what was happening with climate change when you have the droughts and then you have the deluge. There was so much snow that year that the wildflowers were three to four weeks late. And um, so there was no one else around when we were up there. So uh, as I mentioned, I was carrying 85 pounds of gear. Normally I'd carry 65 pounds of gear on our day hike, on our day hikes to get uh, images of flowers that we recorded out in the field using only natural light. And we'll talk about that later. And we almost always came back when it was dark because there was always another flower to photograph. And um, in order to pay for the work we were doing, we were fortunate to connect with some art consultants and architects who were working on healthcare projects. This was the Kaiser Redwood City Medical Center where 34 images were built into the architecture. And these are 20 foot wide, eight foot tall lobby dividers. And there were seven, they were all color, color coded. So whenever we could, we encouraged our art consultant to use images of native plants and, and native wildflowers uh, as photographs. So this is a type of uh, wildflower portrait photography that I developed uh, that allowed me to get the flower petals gently in touch with a filter over a wide angle lens. Uh, I called that the contact series. And we'll talk about this abstract way of photographing flowers later when we take you behind the scenes and tell you exactly how we've gotten the images we've gotten over the past 30 years. And living in the Bay Area, we can find flowers blooming 12 months of the year, um, but there aren't very many in the winter. So we like to go out at times and photograph uh, birds and wildlife refuges. And these images were used in healthcare uh, as well as the flowers and other nature scenes. And these last two were Merced National Wildlife Refuge. And we also have fun sometimes with birds singing to us or flying right over our heads as we're photographing. This was at San Gregorio State Park as we were photographing um, seaside daisies. So one of the uh, most favorite questions we get asked is, uh, well, you know, people say you've been photographing uh, for over 30 years. You must have a favorite wildflower bloom. Well, yes, we absolutely do. And 
2003, uh, we were still doing film back then, uh, we heard that above the town of Gorman, uh, which is at the top of the grapevine, uh, where Interstate 5 goes through from Los Angeles over down to the Central Valley, uh, this area was having an amazing bloom. Uh, the uh, All the right conditions came together. So from the bottom of the freeway all the way to the top of the ridge and then a mile and a half wide, which is completely covered with flowers in all sorts of different patterns. And there is so many different ways you could photograph these flowers. This is a detail of what we saw down at the bottom near the freeway uh, to just show you some of the individual species that were there. Uh, you wanna talk about this? Yeah, and this is, we were fortunate to be able to get on public land on the west side of the freeway. The freeway goes between these two hills and on the west side was the Hungry Valley State Vehicular Recreation Area. So we were able to go up some dirt roads and look back across the valley known as Peace Valley. And a, on the other side is actually private land um, that we hope that someday will be protected. So we had uh, learned that this area was blooming so beautifully, uh, made a quick dash down and, and we got there at the tail end of a late spring storm in 2003, this was April. And what made this particularly interesting was the fact that as the storm was clearing, you'd have these beautiful shafts of sunlight uh, m moving across these uh, in intensely colored fields of wildflowers with these deep gray clouds in the background. The situation was changing, so it was almost uh, too difficult to photograph because everything looked so beautiful and everything was everything was changing. And our second most favorite wildflower bloom was Carrizo Plain. Uh, super bloom in 2017. We came over the Tembler Mountains from the Bakersfield side um, into the plain and towards the top we found this area and it was just really fascinating how the difference between a southern exposure and a northern exposure um, and and how many flowers were, were uh, more prevalent in the uh, northern exposure. And the Carrizo Plain runs north and south, and on the west side of the plains is the Caliente Mountains. And people told us, oh, you have to go up to the Caliente Mountains and find the desert candles. And we had seen very few desert candles before, if any, I think, before this trip. Right. So it, we came around the corner, and here were tens of thousands of these amazing desert candles. And so uh, another question that we get asked is, well, you've probably photographed hundreds of species. Do you have a favorite plant? Well, one of our very, very favorites is this desert candle. If you've seen them, you know that these are tall members of the mustard family. The stem is hollow. The yellow stem is hollow. So when you have light coming from behind it, the stem kind of glows. And then the top of the plant has these beautiful, intense magenta buds. As the buds open, the flowers become white and you've got these graceful lance-shaped leaves. So this is a really, really fascinating plant. Uh, so that's definitely one of our top plants. Probably some of the others are the members of the Calicordia species. And so this is coming down off the Caliente Mountains, looking back east towards the Tembler Range and Bakersfield is on the other side. And the plains is about 60 miles long running north to south. This area was mostly yellow flowers. If you went further south, you could have big fields of purple. And here's a detail of the flowers down in that area. And this was taken with an iPhone 6 we figured out that we used probably 12 different cameras because we were work going from film, started with film and went into digital and digital kept evolving. And with doing the hospital work, we needed to find really large sensor uh, cameras up to 42 megapixels. So uh, I, I mentioned earlier, we wanted to take you behind the, the scenes 
and tell you exactly how we've gotten the images that we get. So everything we do is done out in the field using natural light with the flowers safe and sound in, in the ground. When we, we never pick a flower. Yeah, we never pick a flower. And uh, it looks like these flowers were done in the studio using controlled light. Well, we've managed to get these uh, beautiful different light qualities because we carry so much equipment into the field. We carry diffusers and reflectors and clamps and different kinds of backgrounds. So the flower in the upper left is uh, photographed in a, uh, in a technique we called uh, botanical portrait. The intent is to get everything in sharp focus so people can see as much detail in the blossom or the plant as possible. So we put black or white fabric backgrounds behind our plastic uh, light diffusing backgrounds behind the uh, plant. Uh, we'll give you an example of that later. Uh, and that way it eliminates anything in the background that might be distracting and fuzzy and, and out of focus. So after putting black and white backgrounds uh, you, using fabric, for a while, I decided, you know, this is getting kind of boring. There's got to be another way to add something a little bit more interesting to the whole composition. So I decided, well, there's using the fabric, maybe I, I can wrap some of the uh, fabrics folds around the plant to make a more interesting composition. So this is what I call the wrap series. And as far as I know, when we were doing this, no one else was doing this. Uh, some people went are starting to do it now when we've been giving slideshows. Yeah, we had a really funny story. A woman, uh, one of the chapters up north, um, <clears throat> a woman who had organized the talk was in Oregon during the talk. And she said, um, after the talk, her friend had fabric from Christo's running fence. And they next day took it out the fabric out into the garden and started wrapping flowers. So we just thought that was really fun that Christo was uh, now wrapping flowers. So all these images are almost always done on a tripod. Sometimes I can get away without using a tripod. Um, the, th the third image on the bottom of the beautiful checker bloom was done. Uh, it was created using a technique called the contact series that I mentioned earlier, what I, I found a way to get the fl flower petals safely and gently in contact with a filter over the lens and over a wide angle lens. And because the camera and the lens are blocking the light that would normally fall onto the blossom, onto the plant, the light that's available for the photograph is light that's reflected off of whatever's in the background whether it's you know the 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 sky or or branches or twigs or grasses or things so this means this is transmitted light coming through the flower petals and so this is a nice way i found to abstract uh some of these beautiful floral compositions i always have a bunch of things in focus in the frame but i like having a lot of things in soft focus to give a more abstract feeling to the whole plant. So it's another way to show off the beauty of all our native species. And if you want to try this, you, you need a filter on your lens so that you don't uh, get pollen and sticky stuff on your uh, lens directly. And you also want an extension tube on the back so that you can focus really closely. So and, the, and that's, um, you, were, you would work with a 16 millimeter lens. Yeah, right? I have a 16. I have a zoom lens, lens that goes from 16 millimeters, 35 millimeters. Like Nita said, you put an, ex an extension tube between the camera and the lens, and that allows you to focus more closely, like having a macro lens. So people always uh, say, "Well, you're doing, you know, you're doing all this uh, this stuff out in the field. How much time do you figure that it takes to do this?" Well, this was the longest uh, time it took when we were doing film. This to create an image of this beautiful desert lily, it took two and a half hours. At that time, I was, like I said, I was using film. We had a Polaroid back. I could check exposures. I could check 
lighting. So after doing a bunch of Polaroids, we saw how we had to bounce light in from different angles to even out the lighting on this beautiful desert lily. There are uh, all these jackets that are piled on the left-hand side to create shade under the leaves so we didn't have bright highlights as a distraction. So after two and a half hours, this was what we got. And this was an El Nino rain year in 1998. Normally, if you people have seen the desert lily, you know that the plant is probably about two and a half feet tall with the blossoms alternating going up this tall stalk. Well, this off, year- Off of just one single stalk. Yeah, off of just this, off of one single stalk. Thank you for correcting me. And this year, this beautiful uh, plant was- putting out three stocks, not going very high with lots and lots of buds. It was putting all its energy into seeds for the seed bank for this plant. And we live five miles north of the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County, and which is a great uh, area for biodiversity. We have 40% of the county is public land or watershed, and um, the diversity is just a wonderful place. So quite a few images in the um, book are from Marin County. Uh, so as I mentioned before, sometimes we'll put a translucent background behind the plant to act as, as, a, as a light source coming from behind the plant. And it gives a different feeling instead of putting just black or white fabric behind it. And I was really fortunate that Rob would be the, uh, He's a Capricorn, so the goat that he is and carry the 65 pounds of equipment. He was also really willing to put himself in really uncomfortable positions to photograph. I was called um, eagle eyes as a kid. I have this really amazing eyesight that picks up um, saturation and I can easily find flowers. Um, so this became a a group effort, the images we consider his, hers, and ours. And mostly ours. For the floral portraits. So this was another image of a beautiful local native plant and another version of the same uh, checker bloom species that we photographed with the contact technique before. Uh, sometimes uh, we were lucky that there'd be uh, clouds overhead that soften the light so we didn't need diffusers or reflectors to create these nice soft floral portraits. And as I said, we did black and or white backgrounds behind the plants. We'd photograph them both ways and uh, take the images home, look at them on the computer and decide how it is we wanted to, I mean, which images we really wanted to save. And we're also, we're always very careful about where we photograph. We don't want to trample um, the area. We don't want to create uh, damage. So often it's by the edge of the road, the edge of the trail. Um, and we look at different angles, not always the expected straight on angle to photograph a flower. This was a uh, 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 set up in Golden Gate National Recreation Area the uh, Rodeo Valley area, we were looking for a really beautiful uh, image of a uh, Franciscan paintbrush. So after photographing the entire plant, I looked more closely and I saw that the top of this plant looked like uh, these beautiful red flames. So it's not always about getting everything in, in, in sharp focus and getting the entire uh, blossom or the entire plant. Sometimes a way to represent the beauty of an individual species is, is an abstract approach to the photography. And then, as you know, many of you know, if not all of you, that some of the plants have these wonderful fragrances to them. And this is our favorite as far as fragrances, the Western Azalea. And this was up on Mount Tamalpais in Marin County. So not only are they beautiful, but they just they're just the smell is just wonderful. So all these images, or almost all the images that, that you've seen so far, are are in the book, and we're going to show you a lot more after we end the behind the scenes talk. Yeah, not necessarily the setup photo. This one happens to be, and this is a photograph um, 
of a Shasta iris that I took up in uh, um, Plumas. Plumas National Forest near Quincy. And this is how uh, we used it in a two page spread in the book. And as I mentioned, we stay near the edge of roads. We really are careful about not creating damage and we work with natural light rather than strobe. And one of the things we really like about natural light is um, you, you always have it and um, you can control where it's coming from. In this case, we wanted the light to come from behind and to allow the stem to have that sense of glowing. And then we put a um, reflector under the camera to fill in the shadow um, on the camera side. So this is another example of the wrap series that, that I talked about earlier. And one of the, the project that we're working on now is to raise funds to create an audio described version of our book for the visually impaired. So imagine you can't see these flowers. We are creating ways that we can describe them vividly and imaginatively so that we can bring you into the wildflowers world and our world as photographers. And if you go to our website, thewildflowerbooks.com and go to the video section, you will be able to hear a sampler where we describe this particular flower. And Ring Mountain is one of our favorite places, if not our favorite place in Marin County for wildflowers. And it was protected with the help of the Nature Conservancy because it has such diversity in wildflower blooms, but it also is the home to the Tiburon Mariposa lily that is only, only grows in, um, in this area in a few in a few locations. And what makes this area so interesting is that there's a lot of serpentine habitat, which is uh, which creates a lot a lot of interesting endemics. Now we've photographed, we, we've carried our gear up to uh, eleven thousand foot passes in the Sierra. This is uh, another one of the wrap series is beautiful uh, alpine daisy. Uh, and it's um, it allows us to separate it from the from the distracting gravel background. And we try to use the folds to complement the geometry of the flowers. So we photograph sometimes using direct sunlight. We'll look at the flower and try. Uh, different lighting technique techniques. In this example, we used sunlight because it, it accentuated these beautiful uh, specular highlights on the iris petals. We also photographed it under diffuse light, which softened the whole image and created a completely different field. So we figured out uh, after uh, timing a whole bunch of flowers that we average about an hour for a flower from the time we take all the gear off, set it up, set up the tripod, get all the different images, uh, uh, different image angles, and then pack up. So like I said, it probably takes about an hour for a flower, but that way, with that much, much patience, patience, we're able to show the plant in what we feel is the best light. So we don't get very far down the trail. Um... People will go with us one time to see how we do it, and then they get impatient and <laughs> don't, don't join us again because it's it's just it's a lot of waiting around. So the other really frequent question we get asked is, well, how much do you Photoshop all all your work? Well, everything we photograph is in the raw format, which means the the uh, file has to go through image processing software. The camera sensor always records the color of the light falling on the scene. In this instance, this area, except for right up at the top in the center, this area was, was uh, in blue skylight. So the camera sensor records the exact color of light falling on the scene. Even though our eyes correct for it, right. we don't see the blue light. And the camera sensor is designed to capture as many subtle uh, 
uh, uh, areas of of uh, color, uh, so there's low saturation uh, that we have to bring back to what it was the way we saw it. And also the camera sensor records as many different light values from highlights and shadows to get a true representation of the scene. So the camera sensor gives you a low contrast, low saturated image, which is totally unlike most of the time what you see. And then we've got to go back into Photoshop and uh, make it look like what it was that we saw that was there. So now these flowers, as we've processed them, the, are a pure white like we saw them. But if we had not processed them and corrected for the color, everything would have had a blue cast on it. So that's what we do with Photoshop. Sometimes we'll add a little bit more saturation to bring up what it was the way we saw it and more contrast and things like that. And in this case, our background wasn't pure white. It had wrinkles in it and it had shadows in it. So we'll bring it into Photoshop and clean up the background. And again, bring up the saturation and the contrast. And sometimes it's really windy where, where we're working. And in this case, we had a lot of sand uh, blowing around and the plant, the buckwheat was really close to the ground. So we had to slip fabric underneath it. And you can see there are two different pieces of fabric and there's um, sand. So we bring it into Photoshop, we clean up the background, and again, bring up the saturation and contrast. So we're dealing, when we're out in the field, we're dealing with heat, we're dealing with rain, we're dealing with wind. And when we were in Utah at Capitol Reef, um, we were dealing with no -seums. We were getting uh, bitten by the no -seums, and we were on our way actually to um, Taos, New Mexico, and we found these penstemons that we really wanted to photograph. So we stopped the truck. We're in the middle of nowhere. And within um, three to five minutes, the no showed up and started attacking us. And I was so frustrated with it. I went back into the car. I got some clean underwear so that we could keep them out of our ears, out of our nose. Um, they're worse than mosquitoes. They're smaller and they their bite is uh, lasts a lot longer. So here's Rob trying to. So this is the only time I'm I'm ever <laughs> worn women's un uh, underwear. <laughs> women's underwear. Um, and uh, at the after the end of this uh, part of our photography, I counted. I had about two hundred different no seeing bites. You know, because I'm spending so much time on the on the ground without moving. I was really curious how these bugs would find us when we got to a place. And I learned that the bugs use the flower's nectar as a food source, but but they need blood to reproduce. And these bugs not only bite once, they bite multiple times and they itch, they itch forever and it takes the longest time to go away. But it's what you gotta do uh, sometimes. Luckily, this was just a small, experience we had we haven't encountered any of that in, in in california yet so we had been photographing throughout the west and created beauty and the beast wildflowers and climate change project and we were asked by the curator of the um jewett gallery at the san francisco main library to create an image that focused on california so therefore beauty and the beast california wildflowers and climate change and there were a hundred different images in the uh, exhibit and a lot of artifacts and ways that we identify plants. We also had things like um, binoculars. We like to use binoculars to find flowers or to see if what a flower is in the distance to see if it's worth heading in that direction. And we also discovered these wonderful knee pads um, when we were hiking in Mount Rainier, somebody went by with them and they're made by ergodine. They're, they're for the trades, but they're wonderful. They're like kneeling into thick jello and really saved our knees, and especially Rob's knees um, over the years. So we highly recommend them if you spend a lot of time on your knees. Oh, and we had uh, panels of information in the exhibit to inspire hope and action and education, educate people about the um, importance of wildflowers in our ecosystems. So that exhibit 
um, was cut in half and has been traveling throughout California. And we were fortunate to have the San Diego Natural History Museum create a custom print uh, exhibit called California Blooming, Wildflowers and Climate Change in the Golden State. And this exhibit where the images were up to 12 feet tall was up for a year and a half and just came down last month and um, reached a lot of people. We figure 100,000 people have seen the exhibit at this point. And to expand on- Not that exhibit. All the exhibits. Oh, right. Yeah, all the exhibits. Um, to expand on um, the text and to reach more people, we decided to do a companion coffee table book with essays by a diverse group of authors. And we wanted to um, have a variety of voices. Uh, they range in age from 23 to 82. And we have people like uh, Jose Gonzalez, the founder of Latino Outdoors. And um, go ahead. So uh, the, these are really interesting first person short stories. Each, each author talks about their experience in the field of their particular discipline. And the uh, their really quick reads are about five minutes each. We, met, we kept them really short because we wanted to cover a variety of topics. So we paste the images and the essays through, throughout the book to, to keep people reading uh, so that they would not only appreciate the beauty of the plants, but also learn more about uh, what they could do to have a difference and learn more about the wildflower story as it related to climate change and conservation. And the third section of the book is called Ensuring the Future. We want to inspire action. And so not only are we... Um, teaching people and inspiring them to do something, but we also include 25 different things people can do to make a difference. So don't leave them just hanging and not sure what to do. So Gordon Lepig, Lepig was a scientist with the California uh, Fish and Wildlife, wrote about wildflowers and climate change. Ryan Burnett wrote a really interesting story about the work he was doing for Point Blue, um, conservation science. So uh, uh, this image was uh, filmed, we took at Carson Pass. This was a really un, uh, unusual image uh, up at the top of Carson Pass. You, you're you probably all familiar with this stuff. There's an area that gets watered, uh, unlike a lot of the Sierra. So you've got a great density of plants with great floral diversity. And that was what made, made this particular scene so interesting. So Ryan's work is studying the effects of climate change on these mountain meadows, and in turn, how it was affecting the uh, Rufus hummingbird in its epic migration from Mexico to the north Northwest and beyond. It really needs to have the um, meadows blooming at the right time so that it can get the fuel it needs for this trip. And the science is called phenology, the science of seasonal changes. Oh, it's the timing of natural events. Thank you. So this was the luckiest image that we've gotten over the 30 years we've been photographing flowers. I was photographing this beautiful, tall, scarlet fritillary in, uh, in Table Rocks area in uh, Oregon. It's a tall plant that, as you can see, it moves very, very easily in the slightest breeze. Nita was holding the black background. For the background behind the plant, she was trying to uh, hold, uh, she was holding a diffusion disc to keep the breeze from moving it. I had my eye right on the camera viewfinder with my finger on the remote shutter released this bird came in I got two frames and it left so we waited a little while longer hoping that the bird would come back you know standing perfectly still and it never came back so the, the image on the right is the raw file that we got 
And then we, as we explained earlier, we take it into Photoshop and uh, make all the uh, corrections we need to do to get it back to how it was anyone would see that flower if they were there. And Ryan has found that there has definitely been a decrease in the number of hummingbirds um, over the last few years due to climate change and it not having the fuel that it needs. So these are some, some pages in the book. Some of the issues around pollinators, um, the five deserts in California, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote um, Braiding Sweetgrass, Native American botany professor, uh, wrote about the history of plant names, which is really interesting story. Wendy Takuda, retired uh, news anchor, wrote a very funny story about her new love of doing restoration work and Zen and the art of pulling broom. Talking to Children About Climate Change Without Scaring Them by Amber Paris. And Genevieve Arnold, who's with the Theodore Payne Foundation, um, she's in charge of the seed bank about, um, so wrote a story about that. We also have a section in the book on fire ecology, fire recovery. Uh, th this particular scene was in Cleveland National Forest in Southern California, a fire had gone through. Uh, this is in Lake County, uh, also public land, the Redbud Trail on, uh, on BLM land. What made this really interesting, uh, we were watching these beautiful flowers come back out of uh, this devastated area. This this whole area, this whole scene had been completely burned. This was came back. This is what come came back six months later. Some of these meadows that had been completely burned uh, came came back to life. What was really interesting was that as you remove the overstory, the leaves and uh, these areas get fertilized with the uh, fire ash, these beautiful lilies that have been dormant come back gangbusters. So here's a, here's a field where all the thatch had been burned away. So you end up with this pure new field of grasses and wildflowers. And this was in Sonoma County um, in the Pepperwood Preserve east of the um, Santa Rosa where the Tubbs fire did so much destruction. But you can see what can happen with a with a land can really use that, these that are, fire. These are some of the floral portraits of species that had come back. Nita found these two flowers next to each other we just the way they are. Uh, just the way they are. So I thought it was a really nice color contrast, the purple and the purple bird's eye gilia and the beautiful yellow California poppy. So we're going to take you um, fairly quickly through uh, some of our favorite areas, which are the deserts. Uh, initially, it's going to be Death Valley. Um, and sometimes it's not always super blooms and dense floral uh, carpets, sometimes it's really nice just to show how life comes out, how these beautiful flowers uh, come out of these barren environments. And sometimes you really have to look closely to find um, flowers. In this case, it was the broom rape that was in among the rocks. And the rambling milkweed with the crab spider on it. Always fun to find insects on there. And in 1998, we went to our first super bloom in Death Valley. And they, at the time they used to call them hundred year blooms because they was usually every hundred years that the conditions came together. But because of climate change, as I mentioned before, the droughts and then the deluge, you end up with super, with blooms, super blooms more often, they started to call them super blooms. So another favorite area is Joshua Tree. Which has a completely different um, environment with a granitic soil. 
this was an area, this was a typical year in uh, Cottonwood Wash, the southern part of Joshua Tree, where the beautiful desert Canterbury bells, uh, there were just a few growing in this wash. Uh, in the El Nino rain year, uh, in the same area, there were so many more plants growing. The rain lasted for quite a bit of time. And so the seed bank was just uh, putting forth so many beautiful flowers. The flowers were taller with more buds on them. And so this was quite an unusual scene to photograph in this desert wash that had this really coarse granitic soil. And sometimes you need to, to learn the uh, trait of a flower. This one tends to close up starting around two or three in the afternoon. We found that out the hard way. And I, we just love the diversity of shapes and sizes and colors found out in the wild. Another favorite area that I'm sure a lot of you have visited is Anza Borrego Desert State Park. And we love the southern end of the park because there are fewer people there. And again, we look at flowers from different angles. This is a two-page spread in the book. So it was an interesting experience. It took us three years to put the book together between getting the essays and the design and pairing images. No, this is where it all started in the Anza Borrego Desert State Park. This was taken years later after that first image. And every year is different. This image was taken uh, on film after we had photographed that beautiful super bloom we described above the town of Gorman. So you can see in this frame, the only flowers that are there are California poppies. So that was, like I said previously, what made that first image so interesting was the great diversity of flowers that we're, we found at the poppy reserve. So as we mentioned, we wanted to do this project to inspire action and, and hope. And so these are some of the things you can do to make a difference. Um, hopefully you all voted um, in the last election and know how important that is. Uh, planting native plant gardens will show you, introduce you to ours. And um, these are just some of the other things. And I'm sure many of you already know about being citizen scientists. And all this information will be available um, in a follow-up email, whether you do it out in the in public lands or other parks and or in your own backyard. In this case, we have a cedar wax wing that we photographed out our bedroom wing window on a cotone aster, which many of you know is a nasty invasive, but it does feed the birds. Well, here's an alternative. This is a toy on at the end of our driveway. And it's just loaded with bird with uh, berries that bluebirds and crows, jays, all kinds of birds uh, feed from. As you probably all know, being CNPS members, Calscape has a great garden planner for finding out what to plant in your in your local area. And we're going to take you through a few images of our own personal. Um, native plant garden. Yeah, we'll do that before we show you the final images we have from our book. And we're very grateful to CNPS and their plant sales and their all their information to know what to plant um, in our area. And it's uh, been really fun to have the, the milkweed, the narrow leaf milkweed. We love the seeds that come out of it. This is a really beautiful wavy leaf soap plant that I put a black background behind in our garden. We found these growing on our property. We didn't even plant them there. We were looking around and one day we, we found that. This is a really nice collection of Ceanothus. And as you know, it's great for pollinators. It also smells beautifully. And if you uh, haven't taken a really close look at a Ceanothus plant, uh, the individual flowers, this is what they look like. 
And then a late blooming flower is the uh, California fuchsia, which we really love the brilliant red that comes out. And asters, if you're looking for a plant that'll really spread in your yard, um, that's a really nice plant to use. If you need uh, help with identifying plants, plantid.net is a great place to start. Calflora is a more advanced. As I'm sure you all know. Plant ID website. Um, Wildflower reports, again, this will be in the resource uh, email. Theodore Payne Foundation is great for Southern California, CNPS uh, Facebook page, desertusa.com. So uh, we're going to return to some of the images in the book. This image of this prickly poppy was taken out of state. We found that in our travels throughout the West, there were some uh, species we found and photographed outside of California, but because those species also resided in the state, we wanted to include them in the book. Including the photograph of the uh, hummingbird. And we're always looking for interesting natural backgrounds behind the flowers. We didn't place that flower there behind the serpentine rock. Another favorite place I'm sure you're all quite aware of is North Table Mountain e Ecological Reserve. And there are so many people who go to places now because of social media that I think they've changed the access to this, to this area. So before heading up there, you might check. So these, we'll just about to end with some of the um, two page spreads in the book. So we wanted to use our talent to, to create what we considered were artistic interpretations of the flowers and, and all the uh, diverse shapes and sizes. We're always thrilled when we find orchids, wild orchids. The book has a section that shows the ecological regions of the state. Which CNPS helped us write and put into the exhibit. It has a glossary because there are so many different essays that contain a, a lot of different scientific terms. And it has a plant name index and a location index. So what we have available is a regular edition book and a deluxe signed limit edition book. And again, co-published with the California Native Plant Society. And if you get access to a regular edition book, we encourage you to remove the dusk jacket to discover this book cover underneath. And as I mentioned, we're working on creating a um, version of the book for the visually impaired and those who don't have access to nature. And this is something very unique. There aren't, there aren't coffee table books like this for the visually impaired. So we can take donations through marinlink.org forward slash donations if you'd like to support the project. So we wanna thank you for joining us tonight on our journey throughout California and the West. And again, if you are interested in purchasing books and supporting our work, you can go to wildflowerbooks.com and also see other recordings such as the audio uh, sampler for the visually impaired. We like to end with this quote by David Brower, truth and beauty can still win battles. We need more art, more patient, more passion, and more wit in defense of the earth. So thank you for staying for the whole presentation. We're just really grateful to have you here. And we're happy to answer any questions through the chat. We'll stay here as long as we need to to answer all of your questions. And we love questions. So thank you. Thank you, Rob and Nita. That was wonderful. I mean, I think all of us here in the Sacramento area are very much looking forward to spring when, you know, we actually get some uh, wildflowers back in our area. Um, I actually had the opportunity to go see your exhibit when it was at 
the state. Um, oh, wow. That's right. I forgot the, to the California, the California History Museum. Um, and so that was a really, really wonderful experience after meeting you both at the CNPS conference um, several years ago. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Oh, wow. That was a great presentation. I wanted thank to you. mention that the exhibits actually at the Yuba, at the Sutter County Museum in Yuba City through November 20th. Um, if anybody wants to actually see see the exhibit. It is very, very worth going to see. It was really nice. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions here. Um, <laughs> one of them that I was also curious about, um, somebody was asking uh, when you were showing some of the behind the scenes photos of the desert lily portrait set up, um, you had some stuffed animals in the photo. <laughs> There's a little monkey. His name is Zorro. Uh, we called him Zorro because on my 50th birthday, we went to Anza Borrego Desert State Park. My birthday is January 3rd. It was a really interesting year because it was uh, a, 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 an El Nino rain year. Flowers started blooming early. So we stayed at a place uh, in Borrego Springs called Casa del Zorro. Nita gave me this little beanie baby for my birthday, and I looked at it and I thought, what, what the heck am I going to do with a beanie baby? But it's come to be my spiritual advisor and art critic. It We take Zorro everywhere when we're out photographing. Zorro looks through the camera, makes <laughs> his observations, gives me critiques. And so Zorro is there. The other person... Cosmic. Cosmic Bunny yeah. is there, and he's great with traffic. When right. we get stuck in traffic jams, he's great for that. And who else is in there? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if Gypsy's in there. So uh, we like to take wildlife that's not indigenous to the area with us <laughs> to show them what California has as far as biodiversity and its beautiful scenery. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> And then the other question that we had um, was asking, have you photographed the same area in multiple years? And if so, have you noticed the composition and location of blooms of individual species in the same area shifting in location or do they stay the same over time? We haven't really photographed the same area as a documentary process uh, to show the exact same location at the same time of year. Uh, we haven't done that. But we've watched uh, Ring Mountain since it's so close to us. Yeah. We go up there on a fairly regular basis, and each year can be different depending yeah. on the rains, depending on when they came. For example, last year, uh, we had the bomb cyclone, which we, we had eight inches of rain here in Marin City where we lived in one day. And then we had no rain in... No, we had good rain. In, in January and February. Yeah. So we thought, oh, we're not going to have much for flowers. But it had rained so much that we actually ended up with a really good year in um, up on Ring Mountain. But each year can be slightly different. Some years we'll have a lot of Chinese houses in a certain area. Some other years we'll go back and only see one or two. So it really, it really does change. And as Rob was describing in Antelope Valley, you know, one year was full of bird's eye gilia, another year it's just poppies. So it it can change. And one of the other things that we've uh, heard about um, with climate change is, is the introduction of invasive species and how, because there's been so much rain at times in the desert, the, the non-native grasses are getting more established. And that's what had devastating effects with the uh, Joshua trees because when a fire burns, they burn more than the native grasses do. And that, I think they said there were a million Joshua trees that were killed during those big fires. So it's, it's during the droughts also, it's really stressing the native plants. So it's, it's been a really interesting process. We haven't been able to document it because every year can be different because of the range, um, but we hear what scientists are, are observing. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, those are the only two questions that we got, actually. Um, lots of people are commenting in the chat how um, beautiful and inspiring all of your photos are. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's something to look forward to this coming season, right? Hopefully we get some decent rains and 
um, we get a good wildflower season this coming year. Yep. Well, we hope so. We'll keep our fingers crossed and that people are getting educated to not destroy the environment and to that they don't need to do the selfies in the middle of a field of poppies so that they end up having to close the park. And hopefully people are going to um, learn that. And we're hoping this project helps with that as well. Agreed. Thank you so much. Um, one last thing for everybody, I am going to go ahead and share the results of our election um, in case anybody was interested. Um, they have been recorded for uh, our board purposes. Um, so thank you every much, everybody for participating. Um, if there are no other questions for Rob and Nita, um, thank you very much. Um, is anybody, oh, somebody is asking if the video was recorded. Yes, it was. Um, and it will be posted to our chapter YouTube channel, which is, I believe, Sac Valley CNPS. So yeah, tell your friends all about it. Direct them to our YouTube video. Thank you, everybody at CNPS. We couldn't have done this book without the California Native Plant Society people and, and the chapters and, and the, the chapters. Members. We met so many nice people. Uh, we were looking for a flower for a place to photograph the uh, the mountain lady slipper. Yeah, the mountain lady slipper. We taught we we talked to someone from the from that area chapter. He says, "Come up here. I'll show you exactly where to find these." We drove all the way up from San Francisco to get that flower. And we wouldn't have known where it was if we hadn't had a relationship with CNPS. So um, we're just grateful for everybody and what everyone does to keep our species alive. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for all of your advocacy as well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks for joining. Good night.